Hello, Copenhagen. Uh, sorry we can't be there today. My name's Anna Brown. I'm the CEO of Equality Australia. We're a national LGBTIQ plus organisation based in Australia, um, working through legal advocacy and campaigning. We're really pleased today to be partnering with APCOM to bring to you a session uh, called Stories of Hope from Asia Pacific. Now, if that's not the session you were planning to attend, now's your time to quickly shuffle rooms. But we were really keen to bring you this session to talk about uh, human rights progress and challenges in Asia Pacific. Uh, the reason Equality Australia is so keen to bring this session to you is because Sydney will be hosting World Pride 2023 and be the home of the Human Rights Conference attached to that um, incredible event. So we're really pleased to have a group of activists um, from all across across Asia Pacific, um, ready to speak to you about their experiences and their incredible work. Asia Pacific has some of the most harsh, but also some of the most progressive LGBTIQ plus laws in the world. In recent years, there's been some wonderful wins, marriage equality in Taiwan and decriminalization in places like Bhutan and Palau, intersex rights in India and progress on conversion therapy or practices in Australia and New Zealand. But we've also seen alarming regression and stagnation on key human rights issues across large parts of the region. A life without fear of violence and discrimination remains out of reach for many LGBTIQ plus people. So today we're going to hear from some brave activists at the forefront of these campaigns, working to ensure that LGBTIQ plus people are free and equal in rights and dignity. Um, and I'm sure each uh, panelist um, will um, make their own introductory remarks um, as they see fit um, about uh, the country and their own traditions. So without further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, Elizabeth, um, to tell you all a bit about um, herself, her work, uh, and also one thing that gives her hope. Uh, kia ora, Copenhagen. How exciting. I look forward to the day that we can meet each other in person. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Kerekere. I am a Māori person Indigenous to Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I am takatāpui, which is an ancient term that we use to embrace all Māori with diverse genders, sexualities and sex characteristics. Uh, my organisation is Tifana Fana Trust, which I founded 20 years ago to advocate for Takatapui so that we may tell our stories, build our communities, and leave a legacy. As part of our work for Takatapui, uh, we've been advocating myself as an activist for 40 odd years and over 30 in LGBTIQ communities. What we've found is that the sites of struggle have changed as someone who also identifies as lesbian and we had 35 years ago we've celebrated recently uh, since we passed homosexual law reform but things have moved and we know that the, the, the real struggles that are facing right now is with our trans, non-binary and intersex people. And so that's where it's really important where those of us who are cisgender and for someone like me who is now in parliament that we use our cis privilege and all the lessons we have learned for our other activism that we do to ensure that we support and stand by um, those of us who are the most marginalized. There are several laws coming up to us in New Zealand. One of them are uh, the birth, deaths and marriages, relationships, registration, enables people to self-identify their gender on their birth certificate. We already have world leading legislation where they can self-identify on driver's licenses and on our passports but not on birth certificates. And when those documents do not match, especially for people who have come here as refugees and asylum seekers, that is a really, really difficult place to be. So this is some, one of many things we're putting conversion therapy through this year. And I'm hoping to amend our Human Rights Act to specify rights for trans, intersex and non-binary people. So what gives me hope is my absolute and utter belief that our people will prevail that for me and our country as an Indigenous person, that our spirituality, our culture will be the thing that sustains us in all of the work we do. So to finish, I acknowledge all of the cultures of all the people who are listening, your spiritualities, your languages, and the sacred spaces of your people. Greetings to your ancestors and to you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Gopi um, from India. I'll hand over to Gopi. Hi. Hi. Um... Namaste Copenhagen and uh, thanks for having me here. 
So um, the thing is that uh, my name is Gopi Shankar Madurai, and uh, I represent um, the South India and the National Council for Transgender Persons. So uh, the South Indian population is more than 200 million. And we work on policy issues pertaining to a uh, gender diverse community, um, more, you know, uh, just like communities. Um, so my focus is more on intersex variations, uh, infants and children born with intersex variations and uh, athletes with intersex variations. Uh, and we passed the very first ever uh, government order uh, to ban sex selective surgeries on intersex infants and to regulate these surgeries in the state of Tamil Nadu with uh, around 80 million people. We have a kind of a recent medical protocol for all this. Um, and the most important thing is that uh, I work also very closely with the indigenous gender variant communities and uh, also to protect their uh, indigenous gender variant sacred spaces. We have specific uh, temples and spiritual places dedicated to you know indigenous gender variants like uh, Jogapas, Arvanis, uh, Sakibekis, and um, you know Mangalmukis and uh, Kinners, uh, etc. etc. Uh, so so I closely work with those communities and some of my close friends are from those communities and together also we recently filed a petition to recognize the non-heterosexual marriages in India under the Hindu marriage law. Um, so in India, we have, uh, you know, specific uh, marriage laws, and then we have challenged it uh, in our uh, first petition this year. Um, so happy to be here. And also one of the most important issue I also focus is, you know, um, uh, the discrimination within our community and educating our own community about the diversity within our community. So um, that is one of my key focus too. And uh, coming from India with a lang, you know, with uh, more than, uh, you know, a thousand plus languages here. So we work on uh, native languages, you know, reaching people in their languages. We started 24 into 7 helpline and um, of course uh, you know the national council for Tri transgender persons is the first statutory authority uh, focusing on you know diverse OGS issues in India um, to, it, it, it's like an eight years struggle for us and then uh, uh, through a parliamentary act this was formed and uh, I was nominated as the um, you know uh, uh, south representative whereas um, I'm the first intersex person to hold this public office. Um, so I also acknowledge, uh, you know, my uh, ancestors from South India, as well as, uh, uh, you know, all those people who worked um, uh, so hard so that, you know, I'm standing on their shoulders. I must acknowledge them. And um, I, I'm, uh, I'm so happy that uh, uh, a lot of known faces to me um, are here. So um, I hope, um, you know, like, uh, uh, we we uh, we are here. We came here uh, to kind of you know uh, uh, really show the diversity uh, in this world and uh, um, to to you know go beyond this out of boxes and uh, you know um, to just flow like river, not you know being very static. And um, uh, so and also, um, I I personally believe. Uh, my uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, and sex characteristics is one important aspect of our life. Um, but that is not everything about our life. And uh, so um, we, uh, I'm here, uh, and we are here to go beyond all these identities um, to, you know, treat everyone, you know, equally in our own inclusive spaces. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Jennifer from Taiwan. Hello, good uh, afternoon. Hello, everybody. Dajiahao is a Mandarin. Uh, say hello, everybody. And I'm Jennifer Lu. I'm from Taiwan. So my organization is Taiwan Equality Campaign. Previ previously, people know us as um, Marriage Equality Coalition Taiwan. So we have been working on pushing the marriage equality bill in Taiwan for many years. And also my personally working in the LGBT movement for over 17 years. Um, um, so Taiwan Equality Equality Campaign is uh, like a uh, human rights, uh, LGBT rights organization, but especially we are working on encourage uh, LGBT people to participate in the politics. 
the reason we want to do that is because during the marriage equality campaign, we we realized that we need more allies in politics to make sure we have enough representative. Um, I, I think we learned a lot from this campaign, but the most important thing for me personally is I see a lot of uh, momentum in our civil society and marriage equality as a very important issues in Taiwan for younger generation. And that generation actually had a very important um, education, educational environment because we, uh, we have a uh, very important important policy called gender equity um, gender gender equity education act so that means every students they have the opportunity to learn lgbt inclusive curriculum in schools that uh, change the whole generation and and the taiwan society so uh, we are going to uh, continue this important work on social education, but also the equal rights, we uh, actually haven't achieved that. Um, we still need to uh, win the co-adoption rights and the rights to use artificial reproduction technology in Taiwan, and also the transnational marriage. Um, Taiwan as the first uh, um, country in Asia uh, to have marriage, but right now uh, a Taiwanese still cannot marry another foreigner from their country having uh, passed the uh, marriage law. So that is inequality. So the hope for me is um, in these years, I, I saw a lot of um, momentum and the power of people. And that gave me the hope that uh, with the every little efforts we work together, we can achieve everything. So I hope uh, you also have this belief. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Jennifer. And um, next we have Midnight, who um, works regionally um, on LGBTIQ plus issues. Sawadee everyone from Bangkok, Thailand, and to everyone attending the World Pride Copenhagen 2021. Hope you're all staying safe and staying well. My name is Pitnai Punkaset Watana. I go by the pronouns he, him. Um, I am originally from Thailand and work as the executive director of APCOM. As um, Anna says, uh, it's a regional um, nonprofit organization established in 2007, working on LGBTQI human rights and HIV working with over 200 community groups um, across the five countries in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, Anna, and also Equality Australia for working with me and APCOM together for this session. What gives me hope um, is actually working with the communities. The effect of COVID-19 has demonstrated the importance of the community organizations to reach and support the most vulnerable marginalized in our communities. I get to work with you know, the most passionate, um, inspiring people and those on these panels as well, who despite challenges are able to support their own communities. Every year, APCOM hosts the um, Hero Awards that acknowledges uh, outstanding LGBTQI and HIV advocates and allies across the region. In 2020, despite the pandemic, we continue to do the Hero Awards. And it was amazing to hear stories of hope and inspiration who received the, um, the awards uh, from Fiji, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Thailand, and Tonga. So many are risking their lives actually to do the work within their communities. They give me hope that there's a lot of dedicated and passionate people out there within our communities that are committed to changing the world. So we are currently gearing up for the 2021 Hero Awards and we hope that this would also give hope and inspiration to the region and the world as well. Thank you. Thank you, Midnight. Um, and handing over last but certainly not least, Imanya. Salo Falava, Copenhagen. So, I will tell you that Lala is a more to be seen than Imanya Brown. So, to sell my few hours and apple for Latai to a night in a way of Silta. I will wow mau, Mangaloe Queen Silani of Sayane, it's a ton, or I will ele ele mando to Nata Yakra. Um, so, hi Copenhagen, I am Imania, Trisina Imania Brown, and I come from the villages of Sanapu, Falatai, Tuanai, and Vaivaseuta in Samoa. For now, I live and work in Queensland, in Australia, um, on the lands of the Yegra Nation people. 
Um, what am I working on? Look, I'm working on a, on a project with the Tonga Leiti Association at the moment for a submission for the decriminalization of homosexuality in Tonga. That is, is, is on the calendar, hopefully this year. Um, and we're also giving some support to the Cook Islands um, because they are the two countries that are our focus um, for this year. I'm also working on a project um, funded by Outright through Fa'ine Aotearoa New Zealand for an online in memoriam um, symmetry type um, scenario or, 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 or platform space for our lost Pacific LGBTIQ elders to be launched later this year. Um, because for us ancestors and their knowledge passed through to us are crucial to our survival as LGBTI rainbow communities in the Pacific. And of course, you know, in my other hats, um, I am deeply embedded in the planning of the Ilga World Conference in 2022, next year in Los Angeles, and hope to see most, if not all of you there. And navigating, navigating the very intricate relationship between culture, the rule of law and religion in our Pacific communities because they affect us. So, you know, they're, they're our key priorities for, 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 for this year. What gives me hope? Um, sadly, um, very little hope today. Lately, I have not focused on the positive, on, on hope. It's been difficult, very difficult for me um, since COVID-19 to see so many of my family in Tahiti in New Caledonia and now in Fiji suffer because of COVID-19. Though I live in Australia, my heart breaks seeing my people, my Pacific people succumb to this pandemic. For me, I do not see hope here. I see the day-to-day -day survival, you know, the struggle, the just getting out of bed and finding the strength to stand up, to take a deep breath, to summon the energy to carry on the fight, to endure, you know, and to survive. I know hope is out there, it would never leave us, you know, um, it would never leave our consciousness. But at the moment, hope is covered in the blood of my Pacific people who have died and are suffering from COVID-19, not to mention my trans siblings around the world who have lost their lives to violence and discrimination. So yes, hope lives, but my reality is a different story, at least for now, we fight on. I wish you all the best. Well, thank you, um, Imanya. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. I think uh, there's a bit of a common theme there in terms of the hope that we do have. Um, so much of it rests on um, the inspiration that all of you provide and all of the other activists around the world that we work with collectively, um, the hope and inspiration that we all draw, draw from that solidarity and that work together um, is, is so strong, even though we do um, face um, such an incredible incredibly difficult time at the moment. Um, we're now going to move into um, some questions for the panel. Uh, we, we do encourage uh, members of the audience to submit questions. You've got about 60 minutes or so. Um, we've got someone's ready, uh, pre-prepared, but we'll also be um, really interested to hear from you. So please do, we don't know how they're gonna do it, do we? Thanks everyone. Now we're going to move to the live section of the panel discussion. Uh, we're really pleased to be with you today. Uh, we've got all of our panelists, uh, I think via Gopi, which is wonderful. And we'll be continuing the discussion. Um, having heard from a number of our panelists about what gives them hope. And we're now gonna deal with some of the challenges ahead. And I'll throw to Amanya first. Um, what do you see as some of the key threats uh, in, in Asia Pacific uh, to achieving human rights progress right now? Oh, thanks for that, Anna. Um, look, for us, the, the key, for amongst the Pacific activists, 
key amongst our priorities is law reform. Law reform. Mm. And we've broken, we've broken the law reform up because there's about two, four, there's seven, seven countries that still criminalize homosexuality in the Pacific. Phase one of our attack is through uh, Cook Islands and Tonga. We've considered Cook Islands and Tonga to be the, the, the low hanging fruit. So they, they have all our attention. Has unfortunately they, the, the review was going to come up this this year, but now they they pushed it as a parliament. They pushed it to next year, so we're still getting all the groundwork prepared and, and 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 making sure that we're ready for the for the parliamentary submissions next year. Same with Cook Islands; it's in limbo at the moment, um, and we're we're asking overseas um, commentators and, and and people overseas to please let the Cook Islanders deal with the situation because the more, usually with smaller Pacific Island nations, the more, the more vociferous the voices are from overseas, the more small island nations put up the shield and say, no, we don't want any external outside influence. We know people on the, in the Cook Islands, we know people in Tonga, we're working with them and we're working with select few people from the Pacific who are in Australia and New Zealand to help guide us through this process. And of course, one of them is, is, is one of our panelists is Dr. Elizabeth Kerekere, because, you know, as we know, she's now in the New Zealand parliament. So we, we're leveraging those connections to make sure that when it comes time for the vote in Tonga and Cook Island parliaments, that it's easy, it, 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 it segues very nicely into kind of like a, a passage of the decriminalization work that we're doing. So for us, law reform, really important. Phase one, as I said, Cook Islands and Tonga, either late this year or early next year. Phase two is the more, more difficult countries like Kiribati, Samoa and Tuvalu. Um, and then of course, phase three, which is much later, is Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. They're the more difficult, difficult nations because, because they have not just the laws of the land, which is based on, you know, um, um, a European law, but also they have law, which is L-O-R-E, which is based on tribal law that has existed for so long in, in those countries. And, and there's those, that, that's a very tangled web that we need to, to make sure our people, are, our LGBTI citizens are protected in, in any of the fallout that comes from this. So law reform for us, mm -hmm. these are the independent nations. But then we have to also worry about the territories because there's a lot of oh. um, French, New Zealand and US territories in the Pacific. Places like Tahiti, New Caledonia, New Way, Tokelau, American Samoa and Guam. Like they, yes, the laws of their, of their parent states have been changed, but it, quite often it doesn't filter down to the Pacific in terms of the local oh. laws. So that's, that's, a, that's also a long play. That's a long going process that we need to kind of like focus on. So for us, law reform really important. COVID-19, look, um, it's affected Fiji, New Caledonia and Tahiti the most here in the Pacific. Huge numbers. Um, and and it's, it's concerning to see that um, some Pacific nations, because a lot of the Pacific nations are, are relying on tourism as their major, mm. the, as, as a major import. And of course, with border closures, it's really impacted the nations. So for us to now consider because you know everything is about money these days. To consider opening borders and doing travel bubbles with the the bigger tourist markets of mm. Australia and New Zealand, it's a concern for the Pacific nations because you know all you need is like one one Delta case to go through to the community, and it's like mm. it's a population of two hundred thousand. I mean, you know, some some countries in Europe have those have those numbers with like have that many cases in like a month. Mm. So it's 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 yeah. Those those are those are the concerns that we have in terms of that. Highlighted mm. amongst that is a concern also um, in Fiji of because of COVID, um, the, the access by HIV patients to medicine, because the ships that would come through are now not as com coming through um, as, as much because of COVID. So the access mm. by people living in remote areas to very important medicine, uh, medicine such as HIV medicine and, and, and things like that, it, it's, it's becoming an issue, but they're working through that, which is, which is really good. And the last thing is, of course, this is an ongoing thing. This is the, um, the issue of cultural acceptance, right? The issue of, um, I mean, recently, like a couple of months ago, a very well-known brother of ours from Tonga was murdered, uh, Poli, oh. Poli Kefu, um, who was the president of the Tonga Laiti Association. And, 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 it, and it, was, it was a senseless loss of his life and an amazing activist in, in the Tongan community. 
but um, it's highlighted the whole issue for us around the terminology, the use of terminology of LGBTIQ. And in the Pacific, we don't actually identify as L LGBTIQ. We have our own cultural terms like takatapu in New Zealand, you know, vakasalewalewa in Fiji, you know, and it's the same in Asia as well. There's mahu, I mean, you know, in other Pacific terms, palopa, fafafine, akavaine, you know, leiti. Same thing in Asia, you know, uh, same thing. It's, we're trying to, there's cultural acceptance of these identities, but then we bring the LGBTI terminology in. There's a little bit of a pushback from indigenous communities to say, mm. yeah, because usually when we, when, they, when we mention LGBTIQ, the first thing they say is, oh, you want gay marriage, don't you? And you know, Christianity is so embedded in there that they're so against it. And so all the other rights that we have, mm. none of us want what marriage, like, like none of the Pacific people want, want to be married. They just like, you know, it's like the, 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 the Pacific people I've spoken to is like, well, you know, no, they can answer to God for all the problems they've caused in marriages. We don't want any marriages, you know. I think the thing with subsistence type, subsistence type economies like in the Pacific, right? All we care about is our family, the close knit communities that we, we thrive and live in, being part of a community, being accepted, a roof over our head, a food over our table and tendering to the young and the old. That's all we care about. At the end of the day, it's, it's, we don't want to climb corporate ladders. We don't want to, you know, we don't want discrimination issues. And I'm not saying they're not important. They are very, very important. They're very important. But all I'm saying is context, con contextual priorities. Priorities are really important for us. And let's just do decriminalization first. Let's get those laws off the books. Then let's, let's move to the next the next level and the next level. So that's that's my, my intervention for today. Thanks, Amanya. Um, really useful insights there and highlighting the importance of finding sort of culturally appropriate ways of working and driving change. Um, I'm going to throw to Elizabeth and Jennifer in a little minute to, for detail on your country context. But before we do that, let's look, let's look at the broader uh, snapshot of Asia from Midnight. And um, what are your reflections, Midnight, on one of the... Um, I guess the challenges and gaps in protection for for those communities that you work with, um, and are there any differences when compared to Amanya's analysis of uh, those specific island countries? Um, not so different, but in terms of when it comes to the law, because there's still the criminalization um, of homosexuality, particularly from the um, British co um, colonial countries that's still existing. Um, you know, we have the the news uh, from India in 2018, the decriminalization, decriminalization happened. And then the, uh, so recently also Bhutan decriminalized. Um, there are other countries that need to also go through that process as well. Um, uh, you know, we've seen some on the uh, news about the um, litigation happening in um, Singapore, you know, even for economically developed um, um, country, um, it, having to go through those kind of like um, process and I think it, it needs to have more of those um, litigations happening um, around the region and also globally uh, particularly when we see that the UK has also gone through their processes to actually decriminalize and now have uh, you know the process of going through the um, a civil partnership and then you know marriage equality for LGBT uh, people. So I think um, you know we need to rethink um, about you know which laws that we need to keep um, in our region and then um, who are we actually responding to in terms of um, ensuring the rights of our um, uh, populations are also protected. So I think that that so those are the kind of like um, the the more broader macro I guess um, level discussions that's, that's happening. Uh, Yumania talked about um, the civil society, the communities actually they're coalescing and actually you know making the big voice. We really need to ensure that happens. Um, right now, you know, there's been some trends in terms of the shrinking civil society spaces. Um, uh, human rights talking about it even on the streets and now online increasingly, particularly with COVID-19. Uh, we have seen um, that space really shrinking. Um, governments are now putting laws uh, on much hard, harsher um, practices and policies for um, organizations receiving funding from abroad, uh, you know, thinking that this is really like, undermining some of the um, national security uh, when it's actually about um, building up the um, civil society, strengthening um, uh, movements uh, um, and you know celebrating diversity within the country. So that 
so, so things things are changing. I think on the ground, and then the, those who are in power are now like trying to really do much of the the, the controlling the civil society um, spaces, particularly talking about something that's like not the cultural norms. You know, we are basically existing really much on the margins, and you know, being representing and talking about our own issues and making sure that in society we do exist. You know, that goes against um, some of the kind of like the no, um, normal. Uh, kind of normal um, discussions, even for country like where I'm from, Thailand, where it's supposed to be this very uh, more uh, you know open um, as a culture, but then our our laws and policies is not um, see us as uh, our citizens, and we have to have many discussions about you know, what is the rights of LGBT in um, in us in a country that's really promoting LGBTI tourism because you know we want funding we want to we want to be seen as culturally open but you know we're not giving the the rights to um, transgender people to have their gender recognized on the national um, IDs um, to dress how they want to dress in the, um, in institutions like in, in education university um, to not be discriminated at work you know, and then we're having this kind of, same kind of issues also about like how to bring up issues on the intersex as well, so then um, they, they can be recognized. Um, young people in particular, you know, now they identify as um, queer or you know non-conforming and um, you know non-binary. So how do we deal with the young people now who are talking more online on, on, on those spaces? So I think in terms of the institutions that is supposed to protect us are not really equipped um, in themselves to do that. And they rely on you know, activists and organizations like ours here to work together to see like what would be the, uh, the pathway to um, get some of the um, uh, issues to be part of the, the national discussions and, be, uh, and come into, um, into laws. But the most important bit is actually about the protection you know, even without that decriminalization, we need protection as citizen, right? So non-discrimination and those protections APCOM has been working in the region since 2007, so we do a lot of work, particularly around the HIV and then um, at the um, uh, uh, Commission on HIV and the law, you know, in particular, um, in 2000, well, seems like a long time ago now, 2011 and 2012, um, you know, we're still talking about the same thing that um, Yimani talked about in terms of the um, uh, of the laws and policies and then making sure there's um, non-discrimination. Uh, for, for COVID-19 period, we also know that the funding actually is an issue to ensure that our communities can sustain and be resilient. And without um, funding, you know, we're, we're not able to support ourselves and also support our own communities. Yemani, I think before this call, we talked about the funding that goes into Asia Pacific region, you know, and I think it's not only like um, from the um, Global Philanthropy Projects report 2017-2018, only 5.5% of the global LGBT funding actually comes to our region. The, the, biggest, <laughs> the biggest region, you know, with the yeah. biggest uh, LGBT community, we're receiving 5.5%. So I think that is something incredibly, uh, you know, not right. Um, so I think we need to really address that. Uh, I think for also for Afghanistan, what's happening right now, you know, is really sad and how do we then support our communities there? Um, yeah, with the Taliban takeover. Absolutely, Midnight. Thank you. And there's some, they're really, I think we all echo your words around the horrific situation unfolding in Afghanistan at the moment, sending uh, love and solidarity to everyone there. Um, uh, so some common challenges uh, between um, the different parts of the region. I want to throw to Elizabeth now, not the least because I think uh, given our late start, um, she might have to pop off the call a bit early, which is completely fine. Um, and so you talked a bit about a focus on trans and intersex reform in New Zealand at the moment. Um, now, I know I've heard some um, or read some of the media commentary around the debate around legal recognition uh, of gender for trans people uh, in your country. Um, and it made me think, well, when you're talking about challenges, uh, you know, TERFs and some of those types of um arguments, I guess, around trans people are, are really becoming more prevalent in countries like Australia and New Zealand. Um, mm. how, do, how do you see those challenges playing out in your local context? Uh, so overall, uh, it was interesting to watch that pre-recording because they, they talked about some pieces of legislation that we hoped were coming up this year. And I'm happy to say that just this month, we had conversion therapy and birth system marriages come up over the last two weeks. It's a big deal. 
uh, especially births, deaths and marriages that enables our trans, intersex and non-binary people to self-identify on their birth certificate. Uh, we're very excited about it. All us cis people in Parliament that have been helped, you know, that we've tried to work in Parliament, but for someone as a cis ally who has helped work in the community for so long to get to this point is very, very exciting. Uh, because we know that even if people might have a problem, and no matter what transphobic activists try and do, and the hate that they spread in the world, I was going to say they can suck it. Um, that probably is not really politic to say on this, on this thing, but they will fail. They will fail. All their efforts will be for nothing because the law is happening. It's going through. We already have this for our driver's license and our passports. And as I like to say, the sky did not fall down. No woman's group was harmed in the making of that law and the rights of trans, intersex and non-binary people to live with dignity in their own country. The other one is conversion therapy, which we know for decades, decades and decades has been happening. And that um, has a particular focus on our uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual uh, members of our rainbow communities. But we know trans, non-binary, intersex people have also been affected by this. We know that people with disabilities have been affected by this. So we're very proud that that law is going through as well. It's not perfect, uh, but we, are, we're telling everybody to swamp the submission process when uh, people get to submit to the select committee and uh, get on top of all of that because it's, it is happening and, and the changes to our human rights, all those things are underway. So it's very proud. I'm very proud of that work that is going on, but we have to keep an eye on it. We have to make sure the language is right. We don't want to claim to provide something for um, members of our community and then we stuff it up. And, and it's like we may not as well not do it if we don't do it properly. Uh, coming back though to some of the things that people were saying before, firstly, absolutely, if there's anything we can help with uh, and you just let me know when's the right time to jump up for supporting the efforts for decriminalization in the Pacific, we know that must be led by activists who are on the ground, uh, but whatever we can do uh, um, in this country to support that work, then we must and uh, I'm up for it. You just let me know. So yes, there's... Thank yes. you, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, it's so wonderful to hear that uh, the government and parliamentarians in New Zealand are staring down um, the opposition to trans rights. It's it's really heartening uh, to hear. And, and we'll certainly, I know um, some of my team have been in touch with um, some of the activists on the ground and providing support, particularly on the conversion practices legislation. Absolutely. So we're, we're sending you all of our solidarity there. Um, in Australia, we're not so lucky to have a, um, uh, the one government that solves everything. We've had uh, three, <laughs> three states um, or two states in a territory move to ban conversion practices. Mm but that means we still have a, have a, have a few more left to do. Um, I'll now turn to Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, you had a massive win in marriage equality, like you talked about um, uh, in your introduction. Um, what were the learnings there for you? And, um, you know, I know we had some discussion and we, had, we sent some marriage equality campaigners over to Taiwan uh, after our campaign in 2017, and we were really happy, the, happy to pass on those learnings, but... De dealing with a very different cultural context in Taiwan. Um, do you want to reflect a bit on, on some of the, the learnings from your campaign in, in Taiwan and what, what worked for you? Sure. I, I think the most important takeaway and lesson learned from the campaign, especially uh, from the uh, collaboration between different countries, I think to understand the local culture and the local values in the like a regular uh, society is extremely important because before we usually see a lot of um, like so-called Western countries, um, like culture or strategies, but usually it's really hard to um, uh, implement uh, in the different region. Even uh, we, even different Western countries, they also have different culture and common values. For example, I know uh, in Australia, at the end you use like a fair 
fairness to be your very important uh, common value in Australia. So we use that terminology in Taiwan to do the uh, research before our campaign as well. It turns out um, Taiwanese people don't re really don't believe in fairness. <laughs> they, they feel like fairness in, uh, is impossible. So if we just uh, borrow this concept from Australia to Taiwan, that will be, I think will be very um, uh, efficient. So we, uh, through the research, we gradually understand what's the common value, what kind of narrative we should use in our campaign. So we realize that um, respect, uh, help each other, and also the social harmony uh, uh, were the most uh, uh, important three common values in Taiwan. So we try to come back, come by the like human rights concept and those three uh, important values together to have our new narratives. So this kind of shifting, uh, shifting strategy, I think is a very good uh, practice for us to do uh, in the future as well. So no matter what kind of uh, equal rights issues, uh, maybe for the, for example, uh, right now we are also changing the uh, transgender uh, gender marker, uh, legal, legal gender marker uh, policy. We are um, changing that at this moment. So um, we, we, we use these uh, learning ideas to use different issues uh, to localize uh, in the campaign. So I think that that is the most uh, important takeaway for an activist, for campaigners. And we find a way to do the social communication to the general public. I think that's the most uh, important thing for us. So uh, right now, we are also still working on the like uh, other equality issues, right? Now we always say we have uh, same-sex marriage at this moment, but however, it's still uh, a lot of inequality right now. So we still use the same astrology and so and share this kind of methodology to other NGOs, uh, not only in the LGBT community, but also broader human rights NGOs to understand this kind of strategy. I think um, um, Marriage Equality Campaign actually uh, is a big uh, practice in de uh, democracy um, for Taiwan. And uh, we can shift in this kind of narrative uh, in our region. Wonderful, Jennifer. We're clearly speaking to a very seasoned and experienced campaigner with lots of uh, useful advice for everyone out there. Um, so when we look at the um, issues, you mentioned um, in your introduction a bit about um, school curriculum being it, sort of a key battleground um, in Taiwan. Um, where do you see uh, that issue going in the coming you know, months and years? And then I'm interested to hear from Midnight as to, to whether that 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 issue plays out across Asia more broadly? Sure. Um, I think LGBT inclusive curriculum, or we can say um, we, we use um, as a, like, it's a respectful education at this moment, because beforehand we say LGBT education. So that link to the, uh, a little bit wrong direction for the parents. Uh, they assume that we are going to uh, enter in the schools to teach their kids how to become <laughs> lesbian or gay or bisexual. Uh, of course, that's impossible. So we just want to uh, share the diversity and inclusive education in the schools. However, um, in this past years, not only marriage uh, equality issues, but also um, gender equity education uh, face a huge uh, backlash because a lot of people don't really understand this, especially the parents. However, during the campaign, we uh, we understand beforehand, we spend most of uh, of our resources in schools, but we haven't got enough opportunities to uh, start this communication education with parents. So 
the the students, the kids, they uh, learn the correct uh, knowledge about LGBT people, but the community. However, um, they there are huge gap between parents and children. So right now we are shifting our um, kind of direction to make sure the parents do understand the real concept of LGBT inclusive curriculum. So uh, maybe they can learn down their anxiety and make them understand the reason we want to provide this education is uh, because we want to create a more friendly and equal and respectful harmony society. Mm. So this is mm. our strategy at this moment. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, in Australia, we find that anti-bullying or respectful relationships, those sorts of broader programs are a useful vehicle as well. Um, Midnight, how does that, um, does that resonate with you in regards to the um, region more broadly? Oh yes, definitely. I think what Jennifer talked about can be said in many other countries even outside our region. Mm -hmm. um, in the educational system, institution, it's very conservative, right? Um, and even like to talk about, um, you know, sex education, I think that's difficult. Um, and, you know, to have to integrate the sexuality within the education as well, which we advocate to have like, you know, um, the comprehensive sexuality education within the schools, because we know that, um, uh, you know, without talking about it, it can be issues that, you know, for example, Thailand has the highest teenage pregnancy um, in, oh. um, in Southeast Asia. And then you wonder, oh, yeah, why is wow. that? You know, and then because people don't, don't talk about sex appropriately or then talking about um, a protection. So I think, I think those, it, it comes like that, right? And then when, it, when you're not talk, discussing about sexuality either, um, but then people go and find ways that they can, you know, get access to um, hormones, for example, for trans mm. people. And then I think it, it becomes uh, 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 societal issues when you're not addressing um, and trying to support uh, people going through these processes. So Thailand is, is seen as a, uh, the place where people come to do their, um, you know, gender assignment. Um, but mm. then you know, we're not really supporting our own people to go through that process. Um, and it's about how, who has the funding to do that. And we don't, we're not openly talking about it. It's within the communities themselves. So that's why it's really important that actually the education system works with the community-based organization to try to address some of these um, curriculum to integrate that into the, um, into the schools, into the universities, um, high school, I, I, and have this kind of like more open discussion about it. There are universities that have their own LGBT groups, you know, um, but how do then, then the, the education system support those? And then how do you, how do you bring in like um, what Jennifer <laughs> talked about, like uh, parents to talk openly about these kind of things that they don't want to talk about either, right? And they, they can't just they give it to the education system to deal with it, uh, particularly when it comes to the, um, you know, going through puberty, being a, you know, a young adult, um, talking about feelings and talking about sex and then talking about sexuality. This should happen, you know, in, um, in many spaces and without talking about it, it's not going to go away. You know, we, we, we have um, the communities that's already there. How do we bring them and use that as a resource? Um, already not not having to kind of think about oh you know what what else that needs to happen so I think that's um mm. can, it's the same thing that will go on and on in other countries yeah, yeah. I'm going to come back to Amanya in a minute but just before Elizabeth has to leave um take the opportunity <laughs> to hear from her one last time um interested in what uh the New Zealand context is on this education issue but also before you leave wanted to um highlight I guess the incredible progress in terms of visibility of uh, LGBTIQ plus parliamentarians um, in New Zealand. I think it's, you're up to 10%, like the highest proportion in the world um, of LGBTIQ plus identifying parliamentarians. And I think you also had the honor of having the first trans um, parliamentarian in your country as well. So interested in what a difference that's making um, and how that affects the ability to move forward with some of these really important reform issues. I'll start with that first, your second half of your question first. Uh, it's been a long, long time since the legendary Georgina Byers was the first transgender uh, mayor in the world and then the first transgender MP in the world. Uh, she still maintains that there are other MPs out there who were closet, closet trans people, but she's most definitely the first out. Uh, it, it's been an interesting thing. We call ourselves the proudest 
the proudest party is the Green Party, four of our 10 MPs are queer and uh, in the proudest parliament. Of course, though, we are all cis. And so there are no trans, intersex or non-binary people in our parliament. And so it's very, very important that if we're going to claim to represent in any way our wider community, that we have to create that space and ensure in all the work that we're doing that we're working directly with those organizations that represent our people, but people also individuals who advocate in the space in our communities. Uh, so, so that's the first thing I think. I think I'm one of the only ones that actually comes from a background of organizing in rainbow communities. And for some people, uh, it's only been safe for them to come out or they have done so once they're in parliament. And so it's, uh, it's, it's very much uh, something I talk about, no matter what the issue is, I will bring rainbow uh, LGBTIQ people into this uh, and always want to talk about it from our indigenous perspective. I really take the point uh, <clears throat> that Imania raised earlier about some, some of our people don't understand a lot of these concepts, but when we put it in our cultural terms, when we use our cultural language, uh, then that's much easier for them to understand. And that brings us to my, cl my closing remark about uh, education. Uh, we already have things where sexuality taught in schools. We've had some of our youth groups, especially Rainbow Youth, uh, inside out who work directly with schools, developing programs, uh, working with schools where their issues are coming up. For us, uh, Te Whana Whana, our cultural group has been asked to advise when people are doing our cultural practices, what does that mean for people who have maybe are transitioning when they're in school? What does that mean in, in the quite largely gendered roles of parts of the rituals of our culture? Uh, then how do we negotiate that? And our, our organization, 20 years old now, has done a lot of work around this. And so sometimes we just need to sit down with the tutor, sit, sit down with the teacher and just have a conversation, but it's starting to happen all over the place. And in a gendered process, where, does, where do non-binary people sit? So I think it's really important to, to have that conversation. But the other thing is our country have recently passed a law whereby the real history of our country, the entire story of colonization will now be taught in schools. So it's very, it's a big deal. It's a big deal because people, there's so many adults, they go, oh, I don't know. I don't know what you mean. Wait, just get over it. It's in the past. And it's like, mm, structural racism still exists. Structural homophobia, transphobia, biphobia still exist. And so I think when we can start to have generations of children learning that stuff, knowing what's happened in this country, that will start to transform our country. When every child has a chance to learn our indigenous language, our, our country will be transformed. And because we get all those young people, the difference that will make. And I just shout out to all of the activists who have been working on this and each of the work, if you, the work you do. And um, thank you so much um, for that because it, it, it it leads to success. It, every piece of work is worth it. And we just keep on moving. And, and the key thing for me is not only do they need to know uh, that Māori and that colonial history, they need to know how our people accepted people who were um, with diverse genders and sexualities in the past. That colonization also uh, affected that when they tried to take all of our land tried to take our language and our culture. They failed in all of it. And, and now we're at the point where we can make sure that those, our histories, our stories are told as part of teaching kids uh, when they start at school. So um, that is something I'm very excited about. Thank you so much for enabling me to be part of this. I'm sorry I have to go now. And um, just all the best. Hopefully see you live at Ilga World. Yeah. <laughs> on live in Australia at uh, the next world world conference. Book yeah. me in. <laughs> so thank you so thank much. You so much. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> we've got a few more minutes left, and uh, that was such a wonderful contribution. And congratulations <laughs> on, on all of that incredible progress over New Zealand. Um, Australia too has a, I think, even, an even more tragic um, history of 
colonization but and also um dispossession of our uh, first nations peoples it's really um a really uh, appalling blight on our uh, human rights record and the continuing injustices faced by our first nations people um really i mean they're just something that absolutely lgbti communities need to get behind um tackling uh and being good allies uh to our first nations people more broadly but also um our sister girls, our brother boys, our, our gay and lesbian, bisexual, um, First Nations people as well. Um, Imanya, on that point, um, I'm interested in unpacking a bit more, um, you know, we've had this history of um, sort of imposition of, of Western values, essentially, in the form of conservative Christianity in Pacific Island nations that's overlaid the the, you know, the, the full expression of uh, diverse gender and sexualities that you have in your countries. Um, how, how um, is the, what is the impact of that conservative Christianity today? And how do you see um, that being overcome? And how do we, as I guess, allies support you um, using appropriate language, um, giving um, Pacific Island um, countries and the LGBTIQ plus communities within them, um, the support they need to really uh, take on that struggle for social acceptance and change. And the law reform you mentioned. Oh, you're on mute. Very complex and very nuanced issue, especially mm -hmm. in the Pacific. And you'll find that in many Asian countries as well that had pre-existing um, uh, religions and have been, you know, like basically washed over by by the more more dominant um, uh, monotheistic re religions now. Um, in 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 the Pacific, there's a very delicate balance that exists between citizens and their relationships with with government, and that 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 relationship usually is in the form of three pillars. One is the rule of law, and those laws are always as we know in the Pacific and in many other countries, they are byproducts of colonialism. So we're trying to, to pare back those very anti-LGBTI laws, which is the whole process around, around law reform. Um, so there's a the rule of law, there's also religion. And, and religion, when I say religion, it's like, it's another form of colonization. And when, when, when missionaries came to the Pacific and established these, these um, religious institutions, and Pacific people are like, they replaced their own traditional gods with these new gods. And these new gods do not like, you know, deviations from the norm. You know, it's like, uh, no, no, it's against, it's against religion, it's against God, so no, they will not accept that. But then there's also culture. Culture is a lot more accepting of non-binary and gender non-conforming um, citizens. As I said before, these are subsistence type economies and, 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 um, and countries where we, <laughs> you're not worried about buying a house. We're worried about planting to the season and fishing to the season so that we can put food on the table and taking care of, of, of everyone. Of course, this is a modern, modern day age now. You know, we have technology, we need electricity, we need fuel to, to fuel our cars, you know, so of course we have to go and get a job. Um, these, these things are, are important. The delicate balance of religion, the rule of law, and also culture navigate, like, it, it, depending on which country you're in, um, the way those three pillars interact, it depends, the, 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 if, if it leans more towards the rule of law and religion, LGBTIQ citizens will suffer. If it leans more towards culture, LGBTIQ um, citizens, um, you know, they're, they're okay. They, they have protections in culture. You see, and I, and I see this a lot in Samoa, in my own country of Samoa, where Fafafina and Fatama are very much a part of the culture. So every time, every time we're attacked in the media from religion or from the rule of law, we fall back, we retreat to the culture. Because for us, that's a safe space. Nobody can come and attack us in our culture because when you attack me from a cultural perspective, I have a lineage. 
I have titles and then you're attacking my lineage and then my people will come and stand in front of me and say, they don't care that I'm Tafahine, they'll stand in front of me and say, oh, 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 wait on, wait on, no, 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 you know? So there's that balance and you find that in Fiji, a similar thing happens in Tonga, in, 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 in Vanuatu, in Ukradonia, there's all these, 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 the delicate balance around religion, culture and the rule of law depending on, on, on the interaction between. So when we're trying to do law reform, the challenge for us is to navigate those three pillars and, and, and identify players within each to make sure that we have the support. So when it gets to parliament, we do the vote that we're, that, you know, that we're okay. So yeah, delicate, very delicate, very nuanced, very contextual, which is why we always say, please, if you wanna do some work in the Pacific, Talk to the activists. We can put you in, chat, in, you know, in contact with the activists, talk to them and then they'll say, ah, great. Okay, so Australia, we need some help in this. We need some help in this. You know what I mean? And, and that way it, it, it's, it's easier to, to, to progress. I saw somebody was going to leave, so. I am mute. Anna, you're on mute. <coughs> you're on mute, Anna. Sorry. Um, that was a really good note to end on, Amanya. We're just going to, we're at, we are at time. We're going to wrap up. And um, I just want to thank each and every one of you um, for contributing to the discussion today. I'm really looking forward to continuing this when we have uh, um, World Pride in Sydney in 2023 and a lot more focus on um, what is a sometimes neglected part of the world. Um, and all of those important issues uh, will, will be fully discussed, ventilated, agitated. Uh, by some really wonderful activists, um, not the least yourselves. So uh, thank you again, and we'll call it um, uh, the end for now. Thank you. Thank you.